Joining us now is Wall Street Journal columnist and CBS News contributor Peggy Noonan. Mark Leibovich is the chief national correspondent for the New York Times. Ruth Marcus is a columnist at the Washington Post. And Ed O'Keefe covers politics for the Washington Post. Welcome to all of you. Peggy, I want to start with you. What kind of a week was it for Donald Trump? I think he had a terrible week. I think he took a pounding in part from the press, but mostly from his own mouth. I think he added to the aggregate of the um, strange or outrageous or not fully thought through comments that he makes that, that at a certain point, I think this is the point, by the way, are starting to give pause even to his own supporters. Um, he ought to be growing, and instead, my sense is he's sort of stuck because of how he talks and how he does not bring forward a presidential dignity and so doesn't show that there might be a plausible president inside. I do think, however, we're seeing an act two of Trump. Act one was the rise. Act two is try to survive. A, try to survive his own mouth. And B, try to survive what is quietly happening around him, which is the race for delegates that people are quietly pulling like, like strands right. away from him. We have a two-tier process, the public process, and then these t yeah. fights for the tiny delegates. Mark, uh, turning point for Donald Trump? We've said that so many times. It, it's We're hard in a circle. We've said so many we times. Say it again. I, I would point. say this. There, there was... Uh, there have been many weeks like this. I don't think there have been weeks this bad. But really from the outset of the campaign, we, there has been this exhilaration down, around Donald Trump, which I think at this point seems to be giving way to some weariness. Um, you know, again, it's hard to quantify this. But this seemed like a, a week or a time when, you know, tone really, really matters. And he should be, I hate this other word, but pivot. I mean, he should, I mean, you would think that this is a reach out period of the election. And I don't think he lost many voters this week. He might have. But I think, look, he's at 33, 34, 35 percent. I mean, this is a growing time for him, and it should be. And I think for as long as it isn't, um, he's in some trouble. Ruth, it looked like that Donald Trump was trying to pivot. He met with the RNC. He talked about unity. He met with his foreign policy advisors at his hotel here in Washington, uh, showing that he has, can have a conversation about these important issues that a president will face. Uh, so he is trying to do part of the pivot. Um, he's trying, but he's the victim of friendly fire, which is he's shooting himself. And, you know, when you have a week where the, your campaign manager is accused of battery against a reporter and that's not the worst thing that happens to you in the week, that's a really bad week. And I thought the abortion answer, continuing with your questioning of him, w was really revelatory and a problem for Donald Trump on three different levels. Um, first, it illustrated, we've been talking a little bit on the conventional wisdom has been emerging. Donald Trump doesn't know enough of what he's talking about when he's talking about foreign policy. That's not correct. Donald Trump doesn't know enough of what he's talking about when he's talking about policy, period. Uh, number two, he says something and then when it turns out to be wrong, it's not his fault. It's the questioning. It's the questioning was hypothetical or it was convoluted. And the third part is managing to alienate um, both sides simultaneously, which is really quite magnificent because I really I have to just point out that if you look at Donald Trump's position on actual position on abortion, it is less extreme than Ted Cruz's position on abortion. Ted Cruz would not have exceptions for rape or incest in cases of abortion. And where Donald Trump said, including to you, that he'd like to leave it to the states, Ted Cruz wants to make it uh, illegal everywhere. I would just say, you know, you're talking about wariness, Mark. I, I think this whole week for Trump comes at not only a bad time for him, but really a rough time for the Republican Party overall. There was real evidence this week of the struggles that they're facing on so many different fronts. There was a Supreme Court case they should have won regarding labor unions in California that resulted in a 4-4 split because of the death of Antonin Scalia. You had two southern governors uh, coming up with different answers on questions to gay rights and transgender rights and facing pressure from the business community, which has traditionally been with the party, but now is splitting with them on social issues. Then you had all this stuff with Trump on abortion, but I think even more troubling to a lot of Republicans were his comments again on nuclear uh, weapons and nuclear power, the idea that Japan should have a nuclear weapon that South Korea might think about it, that he might consider using nuclear weapons against Europe or at least won't take it off the table. All of that added up together suggests a really rough time for the party, and that's why I think there's growing concern in these later states that maybe we really do have to do something 
to at least slow Trump's momentum and force it to a convention. Fight. Although it looks like in, in New York and Pennsylvania, at least as far as our polls and others, Donald Trump's got a fine firewall. Things may not go for him in Wisconsin, but he's up by 30 points in New York. He, he is. And I actually, I think I agree with Anthony in that this will, I mean, California, Cleveland, I think, are probably the keys. I mean, I think Wisconsin is an extremely important state. As long as Ted Cruz can win in Wisconsin, uh, this will be a muddled race. And muddle is a friend to Ted Cruz and to John mm -hmm. Kasich to a point, because it means it will continue and Donald Trump will be denied the straight ahead um, you know, sense of destiny that he's striving for. And Peggy, doesn't Donald Trump still have in his back pocket that he speaks to an irritation with even the kind of questioning he's getting now? It's about the, who cares what his positions are on these little things? Who cares what his campaign manager did? He speaks a bigger truth for me. And that other stuff is just small in, in comparison to that big thing he does, which is talk about rebalancing the world so that it helps for me, the voter that likes him. I kind of think at a, at a certain point, uh, attrition happens if he doesn't turn around the way he acts and the way he speaks. I think the key word for him is professionalize, and it's followed by a question point. Can he professionalize his campaign operation so that he has some real governing voices and minds around him who can say, boss, don't do that, or boss, just did the wrong thing, we're going to have to turn it around in the next stop, or boss, you know that iPhone you love? I'm taking it from you. You can't be tweeting like a madman anymore. So he needs professionalized that way. And then he needs a whole deep organization in which he can serious overlook this whole delegate thing. The Cruz people are very honest about, you know, they say, you're all looking at poll numbers. We're going in here and there, and we are getting our That's hands on those delegates. Always, yeah. All right, Trump has to stop that if he's a serious guy. We're talking about the delegates. Well, this is, this, is the, this is the weird thing. While he has staffed up, he's hired a few people in the last few days who have some experience with this. The problem is they have experience doing this in 1976 and 1980, the last time we had a yeah. contested convention. What he doesn't have that Cruz has is a team that understands these rules back and forth and has been cultivating these what they call unbound delegates in the states that didn't have contests, or where there are unbound delegates to be had. Places like North Dakota, Colorado next weekend, uh, places like Louisiana, we had this fight. Yeah. And then even in Tennessee yesterday, where you know the idea that you've been fighting against the party establishment will now come back to bite you a little bit, because he's done nothing to cultivate these people who ultimately will have to show up in Cleveland and make a decision. And if you get yeah. to round three, round four, there's no allegiance to him, and there's no reason for them to you, stick with him. You really do need to have been reading those rules on the back of the game mm -hmm. box, um, just like Reince Priebus said. And Peggy makes an important point, which is um, Trump's failure to increase, um, failure to coalesce. You look at the polling in Wisconsin, and you see Trump was ahead of Ted Cruz by 10 points a month ago. Yeah. Now he, uh, now Ted Cruz is ahead, and Trump's number has stayed flat. He is not bringing additional people in. All right, we're going to hold it there. Pause, everyone, and we'll be right back with more from our panel. At CBS News, we've won many awards for excellence in broadcast journalism. But we don't do all our original reporting to earn awards. We do it to earn your trust. CBS News, original reporting. And we're back with our panel. Mark, I want to, on the last question on the Republicans here, if there is a contested convention, Donald Trump has something that nobody else has, which is a megaphone. And if he says, this is unfair, I have more delegates, I don't care if I didn't get the majority, I should get it because I have more in Cleveland. Isn't that a strong argument for him? Sure, it's a strong argument. I mean, it's a procedural argument. It's an argument that is all about Trump, basically. I mean, we, I was just saying, we were just saying during the break that I mean, there, what was important about this election going in, I remember talking to Governor Christie about this when he was thinking about running. I did a story on him, I guess, a couple of years ago. I said I hoped he ran because it was important to see a debate play out in the Republican Party about who they wanted to be. As it turned out, I mean, so much oxygen, so much talk, so much argument has been given over to what will happen with Trump here, what will happen in Cleveland. Uh, you know, I, I do think that that's sort of part of the weariness we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Let's switch, Ruth, to the Democratic side. Um, Hillary Clinton, in a moment uh, by the rope line, uh, had a very pointed retort to somebody who was charging her about taking money from oil and gas interests, which was a line that the Sanders campaign. Um, it was, a, it was a, what did you think of that moment? I never think it's a good idea to be <sighs> wagging your finger at people <sighs> when you're in politics. It does not 
translate well. Which is well. what she yeah. did and in Which exchange. is what she did, and it's a lot of fun. I don't want to get in trouble for doing it no, to no, you. No, 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 believe me, that's um, your and, and it was illustrative of a frustration that she's feeling that's totally understandable. She was on the other side of this transaction eight years ago when she stuck mm. in the race when it was rather clear that Barack Obama was going to be the nominee. It's reasonably clear, though not certain, that Hillary Clinton is going to be the nominee. But Bernie Sanders is an irritant. He has won a series of primaries. He may well, um, probably more likely than not, to win Wisconsin. And he is getting under her skin. And the, the Clinton campaign would say she's not irritated that he's getting under her skin, but that he keeps saying that she's captive of these interests and she's not. That would be what right. their and, argument for and, why and she... And a double standard, that, you know, why don't you go look at his fundraising history or his voting history? Why are you always looking at ours? Uh, the, it, what it did, more than anything, is expose the real private frustrations they've had over the course of the last few weeks that while he has all this money and he's still running, they can't turn totally to focus on Donald Trump and the Republicans, which they'd really like to do. And you're right, the shoe's on the other foot. But, uh, you know, I think there's some concern that if they don't start trying to define him now before he defines her, there could be a real trouble for them later in the summer. Can I say, uh, I have a feeling we should keep our eye on New York. I know, I think Anthony just said she's 10 points ahead or 8 points ahead. 53, 43, yeah. All right, 10 points ahead. However, I went to one of her rallies in New York at the Apollo Theater the other day. People were enacting the appropriate enthusiasm, but this was not wild Hillary love. The sisterhood of the traveling pantsuit is not there. Then I see, <laughs> then Bernie goes to the Bronx and he's got X thousands of people, yay, really well, cheering. Look. There's something, I feel like I'm a New Yorker. Something's going on in New York, and we're not seeing it in the polls yet, maybe. Well, but I, right. No, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I think there's a, like this been this almost annoying smugness around the Democratic Party just to think that all of the Michigas is sort of wrapped around the other party and it's all around Trump. I mean, look, I mean, this is, I mean, this kind of reminds me of the Simpsons episode where Lisa Simpson um, start, wants to be a vet and she <laughs> saves her first nuisance animal. I mean, the Clinton campaign seems to be treating the Sanders campaign like a nuisance animal at this point. <laughs> Where, in fact, the debate sort of rages, and this is a debate that the Democrats need to have. Speaking of a debate, they're having a debate now over the right. debates. Which yes, is... and, and, and how could it interfere with a basketball game, which, you know, in my house is a really big deal. I mean, it just goes to the, the continuing nuisance factor. But I think that the thing that's so fascinating is if you imagine a Clinton-Trump race, it's not a popularity contest, it's an unpopularity contest. Both of them are, are negative with voters. Um, you know, you talk about, you, we normally talk about enthusiasm gaps, but yeah. here the gap would be um, for yeah. both of them. I mean, he's yeah. more, uh, way more unpopular than she is, but it would be a kind of remarkably sort of Wow. Dreary race. Sour. Well, Who do you dislike least? <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, it's springtime. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end on that sort of depressing Sorry note. So um, thanks to all of you for joining us here, and we'll be right back in a moment.